All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks again so much for joining us for episode seven of Winter Nature Challenge 2022. My name is Brian Taylor, and I'm the educator with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, a little nonprofit uh, here in Norwell. And uh, we are excited to, as always, partner um, with uh, Mass Audubon uh, to offer uh, this program as well as uh, other programs going forward. So so thanks once again for, for joining us. Um, uh, before we begin, just a, a real special thank you to our sponsors, um, Clean Harbors, uh, Lynch Marini, and the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Cultural Council of Norwell, Duxbury, Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, and Citret have all uh, given support of this program and have um, uh, uh, been long uh, supporters of programs uh, like this. So uh, thank you so much to our, our sponsors. So um, uh, like I said, we really enjoy working with uh, Mass Audubon uh, for, for programs like this. And uh, so um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, my partner here for these the series, uh, Mass Audubon's Doug Lowry. So Doug, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Brian. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker tonight. Uh, and before we do, I just want to put in a plug. As many of you know, uh, the North and South Rivers Watershed Association and Mass Audubon uh, are two of South Shore's uh, most uh, productive um, organizations for, for preserving land and educating the public. Well, we have a sister in crime with the Duxbury Beach Reservation, Inc. Um, it's just an incredible organization that uh, really, it's a, they're in a unique situation and, and Chris will, will fill you in for sure on, on their, their history and their mission. Um, but really, and without exaggeration, without Duxbury Beach, uh, there would be no Plymouth, Kingston, or Duxbury Harbors. Uh, and the, the whole communities would be entirely different. So again, it's our pleasure uh, to introduce Chris Lutazzi. And she is the, the very first executive director at Duxbury Beach Reservation after the reservation spent 97 years with uh, volunteer leadership. Uh, at Duxbury Beach Reservation, Chris's focus is to advance the reservation's current strategic plan and guide Duxbury Reservation's future preservation of Duxbury Beach. She has a significant experience in project management with both for-profit and non-profit organizations. She also has extensive conservation knowledge, particularly on coastal beaches in Massachusetts. Chris was previously the program coordinator for Mass Audubon's Coastal Waterbird Program. She holds a uh, bach Bachelor in Science, for, uh, first class honors degree in marine and freshwater biology from Kingston University in the United Kingdom, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Management Science and Finance and Marketing from Bridgewater State University. Prior to joining Mass Audubon, she was awarded a fellowship at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute uh, in the Marine Policy Center and subsequently was a guest student at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute Chemistry and Geochemistry Department. Preceding her work in environmental science, Chris was a principal with Barclays Global Investors serving as the manager of European Direct Marketing and manager of external operations in London, United Kingdom, and San Francisco, California, respectively. So Chris, we are excited about your presentation. And so we'll have you put up your, your slides and, and have at it. Great. How do we look? Looking good. Looks good, yep. Great. Well, thank you uh, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to North and South River Watersheds uh, Association at Mass Audubon for the invitation to speak tonight. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Uh, first 
to speak to people as we are now all virtual for, for quite a bit of time. So it's nice to get out of um, just my own computer and be able to speak to other folks. But I'm especially excited to talk about um, a little bit of the background of Duxbury Beach um, Reservation and some of the projects that we have going on. So without further ado, um, a quick outline for to speak about the background, some of the storm alterations we've seen, some of the projects that we have, um, some of the pro little bits that we've done that community has been involved in, um, our big reservation innovation, and then springtime, believe it or not, for me starts next week, um, along with uh, all the cohorts at DBR and then an opportunity for folks to join us. So for those of you who are not familiar, I'm sure most of the folks are, but just so we're on the same page, uh, we are that backwards L. I kind of like to think it looks a little bit like Italy um, for Duxbury Beach and zooming in here. Duxbury Beach is uh, seven and a half miles. It ranges in the northern, um, in the northern locales of Marshfield, travels through uh, the town of Duxbury and then culminates and terminates in um, the town of Plymouth. So a little bit about Duxbury Reservation. Uh, it's a great story. 17 families decided to pool their money together and purchase the property that's now Duxbury Beach, looking to stop some development that was going to put over 350 homes on the property. I like to tell everybody what the cost was because it's so painful to us to hear that it was $15,000 back in 1919 to buy all this land. And for um, 98 years, uh, it's been run by volunteer organization. We now have a uh, full-time professional staff. It is still, um, the board is all volunteer as well as 15 um, additional trustees that have given their time, spirit, knowledge, and I'd have to say some sweat to the reservation. The reservation itself is 4.7 miles of the seven and a half miles. And as you can see, some narrow bits are a range of about 42 to anywhere to 300 meters in width. The mission for the reservation is threefold. Protect the landform, which is really ensuring the coastal landform stays in place to protect the coastline um, of Duxbury, Kingston, and Plymouth. Preserve the ecology on the reservation's property and allow public access. One of the questions we sometimes um, hear is, is it just for Duxbury? And actually that is one of the reasons the reservation was created back in 1919 to ensure the property was always open to everyone, whether it's residents of Duxbury, but not only residents of South Shore, but anywhere can come and any folk can stay um, on the beach for a daily parking pass in the summer. So getting even granular here to point out the property for those of you who have been here, our Northern property ends where the homes end in Duxbury. Some of you might be familiar with Blakeman's, a restaurant that's on our property. Then we have the Powder Point Bridge moving south. There's a drumlin um, at High Pines. It's kind of a wooded area followed by a large salt marsh. We cross the town line into Plymouth. And then when the homes start again, that's when our property um, ends. There's other property on Gurnet and Sequish that the reservation owns, but we'll be talking mostly about this um, barrier piece right here. So what projects are we involved in? Well, it's probably an easier answer of what projects aren't we involved in. There's a whole host of them ranging from monitoring and evaluation, working on the road, coastal resiliency, we'll speak about in a lot more detail coming up, um, ecological and flora and fauna. This is where our partners come in, for example, Mass Audubon, um, is educating folks and North and South River watershed folks. They're doing horseshoe crab surveys with Sarah Grady um, and keeping up on uh, species counts and population. We all have more fencing names and nomenclature than I think uh, some fence industries have. There's a, a fence for everything, whether it's um, protecting the dunes from folks walking on them to guiding where cars shouldn't, shouldn't be driving. 
The education, a perfect example of that is our partners with uh, Mass Audubon. We offer three days a week um, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday in the months of July and August, um, free to the public programs on Duxbury um, that Doug Lowry, who I uh, just introduced, um, runs those programs, as well as working with Duxbury Public Schools. Um, we just received a grant to help folks from um, underfunded um, schools be able to have their um, classes come to the beach and learn more about um, Dune and coastal restoration, as well as um, Duxbury school system and um, a host of others. We pride ourselves in being an accessible beach um, and every year we've um, increased our accessibility, whether it's folks that have um, mobility in, um, issues, we're working on site loss issues um, to ensure that everybody can enjoy the beach. And also uh, there's buildings on the beach, a lot of folks might not realize that not only do we um, own the guard shack and other buildings, but also um, the pavilion, the restaurant, et cetera. So there's quite, quite busy, but the important part um, from my background um, to talk about is the ecology for just a minute. And one of the great things about Duxbury Beach is though we have a small um, area compared to some of the larger um, land trusts and reserves, we have quite a bit of ecological diversity. So uh, the ecosystems and ecological diversity is really speaking about um, the variety present within a, a geographical area. And as you can see from these pictures, they're only depicting a couple, but we have everything from mudflats and salt marshes um, to intertidal foreshore. Um, and with that, of course, it's able to host and support a large variety of species and use for um, an exceedingly number of things, whether it's breeding, staging, um, foraging, nesting, etc. The big piece um, that we've focused on in the last couple of years is the species diversity. So really understanding the variety of their species um, that are on the beach in those different ecosystems, as well as their abundance. So what you want to have when you, um, you first arrive at a site, you hope that there's a baseline. So you know, okay, on this date, in this season, there are X number of species in this area with an estimated population. That way, as time goes on or storm alterations happen, you're able to then gauge what the impacts to the species were on the site. Um, richness and even, um, evenness is speaking about how much diversity you have and if that diversity is even throughout the different ecosystems. And obviously it's a measurement of health. Um, I like to say when I take people for walks on beaches, when you look down, people might see tons of shells. And if you spend two more minutes looking down, start looking at, is there a lot of diversity of shells or there may be just one or two different types of shells? Cause that will tell you um, a possible indication of the health of that site. This is a shameless um, plug for invertebrates that never get their due diligence um, when it comes to their justice, I should say, on a presentation. Um, piping clover, I'm sure most of you recognize. This is fondly called Pinky, um, who is banded and comes to nest on our beach. Uh, hopefully we'll see Pinky in a couple of weeks. And snowy owls, uh, Mass Audubon is um, really the, the pillar of science when it comes to snowy owls and the relationship with Norm Smith. And we've had our plethora, um, as well as obviously we have a, a host of um, mammals and invertebrates, et cetera, on the beach. So I wanted to speak a little bit about storm alterations. Before we do, I just wanted to point out that this, um, this word is really purposeful and that we want to make sure folks understand that storms are going to happen. It's not storm damage because we know it's going to happen. We don't know where or when, but the beach is always changing. The term barrier beach is a little bit misleading because a barrier beach is always migrating ever so slightly, maybe not, and not perceivable to folks, but it's moving over time, whether it's decades or centuries uh, closer to um, the coastline. So storm alterations are to be expected. And with that, 
um, hopefully with planning and data gathering and a little bit of luck, you have an idea of what actually is going to happen before it happens. So I put a little warning here when we get a little too sciencey, um, though I don't think we could ever get too sciencey. I wanted to talk a little bit about fetch, and um, I'm sure, um, as uh, Doug had pointed out, that the integrity of Duxbury Beach as a barrier beach is really important for protecting um, the shoreline. And the term fetch I like to use, it's defined as how far wind and waves can travel interrupted. As Duxbury Beach is a barrier beach, it stands as a barrier between Cape Cod Bay, uh, Massachusetts Bay, and the shorelines here. So if you can see my cursor, this is all salt marsh. Um, a significant portion is owned by the reservation in the town of Duxbury. And then you have the Powder Point Bridges. All of this is Snug Harbor, Standish Way, and then you get into Kingston. So since Duxbury Beach is there standing as a barrier, the distance to the Duxbury coastline is at its shortest point where Powder Point Bridge is. And at its longest point, um, if we're not talking about Kingston, um, it'd be about two and a half miles. Why is that important? That's important because all the wind and wave that's coming this way, and usually Northeast is our prevailing um, nor'easters, it'll stop for the most part when it hits Duxbury Beach. That means as the wind and waves start gathering, they actually start gathering on the west side of our beach, which means they have very little time to kind of ramp up. Now the picture without Duxbury Beach would be quite different. And uh, if the barrier wasn't here, that would be um, a fetch of anywhere from 20 miles to 250 miles. That is a lot of energy um, that can build up. And the only thing that would stop it would be the shoreline. So, that's why it's very important for us to maintain the barrier, because by definition, we're maintaining the towns to our west. This photo I took um, the day after the third March nor'easter that we received um, in a row in 2018. Some of you will probably remember the flooding that happened um, during those storms. This is normally a two lane road. Um, and this is very misleading because it, it looks like half the road is there, but um, these rills wound up running underneath the road and I was watching it actually collapse in the rear view as I was driving back. Um, so that just shows you um, what runoff can do um, and what overwash can do. And I have a couple examples of what storm alterations look like. Um, and why we try to avoid them by expecting um, what could occur. This photo I took in July of 2017. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking south. You can see um, the backwards L, if you will, of Plymouth, so the granite and Saquish. And then seven months later, after that third nor'easter, you can see that the entire area has been virtually flattened, um, all the cobble has come up from the shore, crossed over the dune and is three feet deep in the road right here. Another example of a past is a great predictor. This is Blakeman's, um, our restaurant. This is the east side. You can see the access road behind it. And some of these rocks, um, I, we would call them cobble. Um, but they can be 8, 12 inches in diameter or just picked up. This was a good six inches of sand. Um, and though it doesn't look like it, there was a lot of material that seeps into older buildings. This is a picture of the overwash, um, which really tells you someone shouldn't have been there at the time, but it was a great photo. You could actually see in this video that the waves were rolling over the beach as opposed to just streams or rills. This is another picture on Oceanside where you're looking at permanent um, posts that remind people where the toe, no, toe of the dune is. And then you have sand fencing. But when I look at it, and we'll have a better picture of this, what concerns me is the scarping that's happening behind the fence. You'll see that this dune isn't abutting the fencing. It's been worn away back here because the water, um, the high tides, you can see the rack line in the fence. 
went further than we had ever seen it um, in the last couple of years. This is as recently as um, October 28th, um, when we, you know, some of us lived in a, a blackout for over um, five days. This is Plum Hills. This is further down south, um, about 0.1 miles north of the town of Duxbury, Plymouth line. And you can see this overwash. There are actually six overwashes. This aerial photo is great because the vehicles can really show you the scale of what these openings are and the elevational difference between um, the rack line that you can see right there and on the cross across the street was less than 12 inches. And you can see this um, fan that's been um, made from the overwash. And here too, we have another overwash um, with a fan as well. This is all salt marsh. And this is where it gets a bit tricky because you don't ever want to put um, machinery into the salt marsh, but you have to remember that rolling over um, is a natural occurrence, but we do want to maintain our salt marsh as well. So we're working with the state to see how we can address these issues. There's a couple more of these that show them a little bit closer up. You can see that there's, it's all cobble. This road has been, we've been trying to dig out here and just pack along these sides, but it's still fairly flat in this photo. Um, and this is about a, a windrow. A windrow, uh, people think of it as the side of the roads. So if you grade a road, it develops almost a shoulder. The windrows in this road um, were 10 to 11 inches deep. So this is all very soft sand in this area. Ironically, the sand doesn't show up anywhere except for way down here in the salt marsh because cobble is underneath it and the cobble, the cobble came up. But that's not to say little, little bits that we do don't have a big impact. And this is one of the biggest ones um, that I like to present. Back in 2018, as I said, um, we had those three nor'easters um, occur in March. And this photo was taken right before them. And back in the 70s and 80s, the reservation had outlined the parking lots. You can see that these are all boulders. We outlined the parking lots to deter people from driving um, where they shouldn't. And when this occurred, um, when this storm occurred, I um, found out that a large section of the seawall in Duxbury, a 90 foot section um, had, had dislodged and now these homes were, um, they were very vulnerable and we weren't through our second high tide of that predicted storm, predicted bad second high tide. So what I did is I called uh, the DPW after speaking to the directors first and I got permission to donate all these rocks to the town of Duxbury um, because I knew they weren't gonna be able to get material to fill the hole before the next high tide came. When they picked up all these rocks, they were able to plug the hole um, and save some of the homes that would have, um, I think, uh, received a lot more damage than they did. But when they did this, you'll notice, um, before when we had all the rocks, there were quite a few pathways. And these pathways were created by people just parking and wanting to go to the water. However, there was no direction that said, go here, don't go here. So everybody made their own paths. And time after time, it created 14 paths. And what that is, is a conduit for wind and wave to go right from the bay side, because we're getting more and more frequent west um, southwesterly winds and it would drive the water and really deteriorate what we want to do which is hold the vegetation which holds the dune in place so when we got rid of these boulders by donating them this is what happened we lost half our pathways because we then had to um, put fence and post and cable up here and when we did that we left the openings for folks to walk through in doing that um, we were able to maintain access, um, but have better health. And this was uh, taken in October of 2021. Now there's very um, clear pathways that people can access. They still have access and we have a healthier system here. 
Another example is in the middle of that parking lot um, here, they were all rocks. And when those boulders went away, we realized that it was flat. So we needed to add a berm. And when we did that, we planted it with um, bayberry, was ragosa, um, a moth of beach grass, um, three different woody plants and grass. And a year later, this is what it looked like. So nature has the ability to recover if you give it time. And for example, giving it time meant putting in the fences, putting in some string to deter people just so they could realize that it is growing and you need to give it a little bit of time, but also to put pathways. In the back here, you can see that fencing and you can see signs letting folks know where the pathways are. And those are the ones that are now um, healthy and green. Vegetation is obviously very imperative, but diversity, as we spoke about before, is, is extremely important. What we never want to have is a monoculture. Um, when you go to beaches, I always point out, it should never look like a wheat field um, for a variety of reasons. Monoculture means uh, reduced species diversification. If you don't have flowering plants, you're going to lose some of the insects that you'd like to have there uh, and maybe some of the other um, fauna. Rhizomes are so important because this grass is growing and their roots um, are growing sideways, if you will, and uh, um, holding the dune together. And that's why my motto is Amophila is king. And if anyone goes to the beach and they only take back one thing to know that grass is important and it's the most important thing because it's holding the dune in place. This is a really good example of, we could have done it the easy way, but we did it the hard way and it really benefited us. So what we're looking at here is we did a crossover project. Um, it was about 79,000 cubic yards of sand um, for 3,500 feet in length, almost a mile. And we needed to plant it. And we had gotten permission to plant grass um, and it has to be spaced at 36 inches per regulations. But when I um, realized that we had an out, um, we had an, an elevation that was higher than what we were planning for our new dune, we decided to keep the existing. And when we did that, I used to refer to them as two pays because they would stand out with vegetation where nothing else was planted. But what we also did is we took an inventory of all our woody plants. And this is kind of where regulations, you need to know them and then figure out how to work with them. So the regulators wanted us to plant grass. They want it spaced in order for other species to be able to navigate through, specifically in this case, um, listed shorebird species. We wanted diversity, but we also wanted to give area for those listed species. So what we did is we went through that whole 3,500 feet and took an inventory of every woody plant we had and counted them. And then we got permission if we couldn't leave it where it was because it was going to be covered in sand several feet that we were able to purchase and replant them. And that's why we have the diversification that we continue to have rather than that monoculture um, of maintaining what we have, even if we're um, adding a large dune to it. So speaking of diversity, we've spoken about kind of flora and fauna, but we definitely have a diversity when it comes to the dune. What you're looking at here is um, a, uh, an aerial um, depiction of different transects of the beach. So basically uh, we work with Woods Hole Group and they um, divided the beach for 3.8 miles into different zones that depict um, different beach structure as well as how the waves and the shore impact those areas. So if you look kind of closely, you'll realize that they're not exactly evenly spaced because it's not based on size, it's based on um, the segments of the different, different um, depictions of those segments. So what does this all mean? This means that if you look at um, transect four, you'll see that sandy, you can see that scarp really closely now, see where the sand fencing is, but then you see that there's a scarp of several feet before the dune actually builds. So this is something where you can see 
the dune is rolling over on itself. And do we add sand there? Do we add vegetation? These are all decisions. But if you look just a couple transects down, same beach, totally different ecosystem. We're looking at a cobble beach that obviously has different needs. So what does that mean? That means that nourishment comes with many different variables. We have sand, which you're looking at different sediments. You're looking for chemical makeup where you don't wanna have uh, bad chemicals. Um, grain size, grain color to make sure that you match with the existing sediment. But also you could be looking at cobble. And looking at this, it's the same thing. You want the grain size, so it's a cobble size. You want the same colors. Um, and then with that, you build a slope and that has to do with different elevations, the width, um, the slope of the beach. But I wanted to stop here because this is a really good example of the innovation of, of 98 years of volunteers running Duxbury Beach. This is a cobble berm that's on the bay side. And um, the cobble berm was put in um, to maintain this side of the beach because if you look at an aerial view, and you're familiar um, with Powder Point Bridge, the channel comes right underneath uh, the Powder Point Bridge against Duxbury Beach and kind of cuts right into the barrier. So we needed something to support it that was gonna last. If you put sand in, it would just wash away with the next currents. So one of our um, di directors um, then and now realized that we needed a cobble berm. And when you think of cobble, where I come from, you think of rocks, um, but there's so much more to that. So if you um, have an angular rock, a lot of people refer to it as riprap. If you have an angular rock and you put it on, um, just think of it on a hill. And when you add water or a wave, if you will, that has a lot of flat edges because it's angular. The water will come up, it'll catch an edge and it will bring that rock down. And you don't want that if you've just paid to put that rock there as a cobble berm. So what you want is a rock that will move, settle in, and then not go away with the tide. So that means it needs to be round. It needs to be the right size because that kind of dictates the right weight. Um, and then you need to put it in the right location. Add on to that, you need to do the same thing as you would um, a sand dune, if you will, figure out what the height is what you want for width, and then the slope or the angle. Um, and because of this cobble berm, um, the bay side of um, parts of Duxbury Beach have done um, exceedingly well. So how do we get this all done? Well, this is where we get into a, you wouldn't believe it. Um, this is an example of what happened back in 2015, and it really depicts the process that exists today. So in 2015, uh, there was a uh, coastal zone management awarded the reservation a coastal resiliency grant. And with that, um, the reservation partnered with Woods Hole Group and they began a significant site analysis of Duxbury Beach and Duxbury Bay. It culminated into a report that denoted what areas of the beach needed to um, be addressed. Then what happened is, the report also suggested we work on coastal resiliency projects. All of this was evaluated, designs were made, and then there was just one step left, and that was the permitting process. And you'll notice this wheel goes slower, and it would have gone slower if I could actually have the option of making it slower, because this entire process takes up to two years. And the reason for that is that there's only um, so many windows where you can work on a wetland, especially a barrier beach, especially a barrier beach with listed species. So for example, we can't have any heavy machinery out there um, from April 1st to August, oh, well, September 15th because of listed species. Just like you can't walk in the water when flower, winter flounder season is there, it's the same thing for beaches. So if you only have so many months to do the work and then you have to go through all these processes, taking two years to do a project is not helpful. And I like to say that we're a barrier beach that needs flexibility. 
And the way that we decided we were going to be flexible is that we needed to not be one, so reactive, we needed to be proactive. And two, we need to be able to turn immediately if we have a problem. So for example, we might have a great plan to work on our northern salt marsh. And then all of a sudden something happens like March 2018, and it turns out we have an emergency. Well, if we don't have a plan and we don't have permits and we don't have that design, we have to start working on all of that. And Mother Nature and the intensity and frequency of storms might not be generous enough to wait for us. So what the reservation did is decided to file for the entire beach. We looked at the beach and said, we know at some point we're going to need to do beach nourishment, cobble berm, road work. What we're going to do is stop our projects and we're going to file for every project we could think we could possibly do so we have all the permits in hand ready to go when we need them we did that and we're just coming to the end and one of the great things about this is that now we will be ready to do any project that we want when we want under the guise of we follow the rules of not working during that period when we can't, but we'll have the flexibility for that barrier beach in order to do the work when we need to. It's cost effective because um, a perfect example, I'll just let this play out. A perfect example is um, you go to Kingston. Say Kingston has decided to build a new mall. I'm starting rumors here. Um, I'm just making this up as an example. But if they start um, building a new development, um, many times um, they'll have a lot of fill. They'll be digging in an area that creates a lot of sediment. They're building a building. They don't want a lot of sediment. They want to get in, put in their foundation and build it. So they need to get rid of this sediment. What they want to do is get rid of the sediment tomorrow so they can start building the next day. Most people won't be able to buy that sediment because they won't have a permit, a, pro a project and a permit ready just waiting for that sediment. Normally what happens is that sediment is then sold to a quarry um, or you might be driving down the street and you see these little signs that say clean fill wanted. Well, we desperately want fill, but people don't have it in the quantities that we need. So with these permits, we'll be all set to go and find those projects or those projects hear about us and say, we've got fill and we need fill and we're ready to go because we have these permits in hand. So that's what it means about cost effective. And it's a good use of our resources. Now we don't have to wait in queue and go back and forth. We've answered all the questions from the 12 different agencies um, that could ask us anything from ranging to species diversification on the beach to archeological finds um, and air quality. Everybody um, has weighed in on this on the Massachusetts state level as well as the federal level. So what does that mean? Well, that means we're ready to go. Resilience, coast resiliency um, is, is a word that's used quite often um, that's really come to its own. And resilience, just as you would assume, um, the definition is being able to adapt to changing conditions. When we have a storm, we don't want to be in, in an area or space that we're very vulnerable to it for a long period of time. How do we do that? That means that we stay away from, on a reservation, from any hard structures. We don't put in seawalls, groins, jetties because we know that we can't change um, the force of the energy, but we might be able to manage that energy. When I say energy, I mean wind um, and wave, wave velocity, wave energy, because that's really what's pounding the beach. It's that energy that's trapped in that wave. So how we approach it is using a multiple um, toolkit, if you will, of resilience projects. We use sand fill. Um, folks have salt marshes. Other folks can use um, oyster beds um, to create kind of a, a natural way of working with what nature is doing and um, giving the ability for the dune to kind of bounce back faster. So all these colors here, um, you're going to see in the next slide. I won't make you memorize them, but this is what 
our beach looks like with all the projects. So the brown is showing you where we do beach nourishment. We also have dune nourishment. We have cobble berms going in. We have road maintenance. So this is depicting our multitude of projects for four miles with, um, with permits that um, last for multiple years and then can be extended. So now that we have our permits in hand, it's time for springtime. And as I alluded in the beginning of this talk, springtime starts next week. So what are we gonna be doing? We're gonna be addressing um, Plum Hills. That's the aerial photo that I showed you where the car was used as scale to denote those big overwashes. We'll be building a dune there and those two overwashes. We'll be um, maintaining 2000 feet of the cobble berm um, that I showed you where the cobble needs to have the right size stone as well as the right slope. We'll be raising approximately 1400 of the road around this drumlin, uh, which is actually in some parts two feet below sea level. And the last project is um, we'll be addressing kind of pulling ponding and pooling, that's where water collects on the road and then cars will drive through it and it will break it up. And next thing you know, you have ditches leading off the side of the road. Um, we'll be um, adding some drainage um, patterns to help with the filtration of the water in a meaningful way that doesn't um, deteriorate the slope of the dune. After that's all done, which has to be done by mid-April per regulations, we have another large project, a much larger project on deck. But before we speak about that, I have a little, the science warning here. We're gonna speak a little bit about nourishment and the goals that we have for reservation is to strengthen the barrier beach, to protect those inland areas um, and know that the storm continuously nourishes the beach. Maybe not in sections that you currently are, are hoping, but sand is always deposited somewhere. And in our area, remember this is kind of the Marshfield area, the natural movement of sediment called sediment transport is from north to south. The problem is right now is that there's not a lot of sediment there. Back in the 1950s, um, there was a seawall put in. So um, the sediment moved, but it's not continuously replaced. As in most places, you have to bring in sediment because um, they've pretty much run out of sediment that's moving naturally in the quantities it should. So what we'll be doing is addressing and putting some sand on the north. We know it's gonna continue moving down the shoreline. And we also know that most of it is gonna stay north, near shore or along the beach. And it's all right if it goes offshore, because remember the wave starts to crest and curl when it hits, um, it hits the bottom um, of the beach, if you will. The top curls over and that's why the wave um, crashes. So even if the sand goes out here, it's gonna reduce that wave height and reduce the energy before it hits the barrier. So this is um, Blakeman's or the restaurant that we have at Duxbury Beach Park. And this is our paid parking, daily parking. And the good piece about um, the area north of this is that it's protected by 917 acres of salt marsh. Right here happens to be one of the narrowest parts of Duxbury Beach. So we're gonna be putting in um, a dune that is gonna run along this length because what you do is you look at that Northeast oncoming wind and realize where are the energy forces gonna be? And then that dictates where our, our dune is. And there's all the crazy numbers to it um, of how much material there's something different about this project than the others is that we're gonna be doing dune nourishment as well as beach nourishment. And the difference is really what is above your mean high tide and what's below your mean high tide, dune or beach. So just to round out, um, we have quite a few projects and that means quite a few opportunities for folks to join us. Um, we have a beach walk this Saturday um, that um, 
uh, the folks are going to be leading Brian and Doug, and I think they'll speak about that in a minute. But between nine and eleven, there's going to be a Duxbury Beach Walk uh, to show folks that have listened um, some of the bits that we've been discussing. Um, on March 10th, there's going to be a virtual Ed Night um, to explain some of these projects and what the impacts are going to be um, to people on access during that period. And then there's multiple opportunities to get involved. I just pointed out quite a few projects. A lot of those projects have vegetation um, aspects to them. So we need help planting um, not only amalfala and grass, but you'll have those woody vegetation as well. Um, we have a beach sweep coming up on March 19th. Um, and I, I, some people always say, why do you do it when it's so cold? Well, now you know that we don't want to be on the beach after April 1st, because that's when um, piping clovers start arriving in March. And we have to have up all our fencing by regulatory requirements by April 1st. Once you put up the fencing, you don't want to go behind it and bother um, territorial um, behaviors that are happening with birds. So we need to clean up the beach um, before April 1st. After that, we have our Desserts for Duxbury, where we work with the Duxbury Education Foundation. It's a great event where you can order all your desserts for your holidays. Um, and they've got some great funny bunnies and everything else. Um, people place their orders and they come and it's kind of a drive through. We have it all organized in the parking lot and you come look like a hero um, for your holiday dinners and all the desserts are made by Montilio, so they're the best of the best. And then we also have a get to know series um, that we'll be continuing where um, people submit questions um, and we educate folks on what we're doing and why we do it and take people's ideas as well. So that was a really quick, kind of probably a, a little too hurried walk through um, on the reservation and Duxbury Beach, but I hope it uh, excites people a little bit to come and learn a little bit more about what we have at Duxbury Beach. Thank you, Chris. It was a wonderful synopsis of all the work you do. It's, uh, yeah, anybody that's been to Duxbury Beach, I'm sure can appreciate. Um, it's so well run. Uh, it's clear that there's a lot of people that care about uh, the beach and beyond. And uh, we, we certainly, our hats are tipped to you. We did have a question um, Chris from from Sue, uh, and uh, she wanted to know how projects were funded. Great question. Um, we um, are very diligent about submitting um, for grants, um, coastal resiliency grants, and um, the coastal zone management in the state have been very helpful, um, and in supporting the coastal projects that we have. Um, we also um, submit for other grants, whether they're education grants, these larger construction projects, for example, um, we have an annual event, um, our beach ball, the second, the second um, Saturday of September. Um, but most of the money is raised through um, private funding, which means door to door explaining to people the projects that we do. Um, and what, why they're important. So it's, it's really through the public where we're raising the funds um, as well as grant money. Unfortunately, I don't think there's enough grants to cover everything we wanna do, but um, we're definitely gonna be doing, um, we do it constantly and we just were very successful in raising money for that large dune project. Um, now we're keeping our fingers crossed that we receive um, a large grant from CZM to cover the cost because that particular project that we're looking to start in September, we have received um, federal funding of 200,000. We've raised over 400,000. The project estimate is 1.8 million. Wow, that's a chunk of change. It wow. is, and to be honest, it's only a thousand feet. That's the difference between doing a dune nourishment and doing a beach and dune nourishment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A um, couple more good questions. Um, in regards to planting at Duxbury Beach, are you planting any beach plum? Uh, it seems to me that they do well next to the parking lot. So there's somebody that uh, has a, yeah. is familiar. 
It is, it is. And um, absolutely. So I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang my head in shame. And like Rosa Ragosa, Rosa Virginia, Beach Plum, and why can't I think of the third one that are our go-tos? Help me out, Doug. Well, uh, poison ivy is a, is a is <laughs> we don't plant that. That's just, that's just a bonus. Um, but you're right. Uh, but, um, and you get bayberry. Bayberry, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the crazy things, um, just to, to give everybody just a, a little bit of, are you serious? Um, there are two different, well, there's a, there's a host of, of different species of roses and we have um, Rosa Ragosa, just a big fan favorite um, on Cape, uh, Cape Cod, the islands in the South Shore, and then Rosa Virginiana. So Virginiana sounds like Virginia, right? Well, it turns out um, the powers that be, the regulators, realize that Virginiana is actually more native than Rosa Ragosa. So first, try to explain to the public that Virginia is Massachusetts and Ragosa isn't. So that's a change. But this is where working with regulators is so important because though Rosa Ragosa um, kind of has a bad feel right now and that it's not true native, it's not invasive on our property. And when it comes to cobble, it works and grows better for us, Rosa Ragosa. So what we did is we, um, and this is where science can be fun, we planted a hundred plants side by side, Virginiana versus Ragosa, because what folks want to see is data. If you plant how many, did they spread out of their quadrant? Um, did they multiply? Um, were they invasive? And did they take over? Um, of course, um, a storm took care of it and put a giant gully through our science experiment. So we're going to have to do that again. But it's kind of, even when you think you know the plant you're supposed to be planting, um, somebody does some research next to you know, DNA study on a on a rose, I'm being sarcastic. I don't know if that's how they did it, but then they decide, um, yeah, you need to change. So we definitely are happy um, with the beach plum and we'll be adding more of that. In fact, we just placed our orders for all of our woody plants. Great. Elaine, uh, first of all says, thanks, this was great. Just curious, has there ever been discussion of artificial coral reefs just offshore to reduce wave energy? So the short answer is not that I'm aware of, um, but there has been, um, there have been some, first of all, I should just say for Duxbury Beach, there are several areas, there's three I can think of that have very significant um, water movement. The velocities are extremely high. Um, and if you look at the beach and you look at that overall, you'll see that the, you know, it's, it's a nice little horseshoe, if you will. Those are directly related to where some of the, the more powerful um, currents are coming in. One is right off high pines, one's a little further north. So there's some areas that that definitely wouldn't work because the product the product, the artificial item might move um, or might not do well because you want sessile um, animals that aren't necessarily happy with um, high velocity water. The other pieces in Massachusetts, what they've tried to do is put um, kind of parallel, if you will, um, groins in. And that hasn't been, um, and it happened north of Boston, I can't remember which town. They did it twice um, and they didn't have very good results with it. So I don't know if they've spoken about artificial. Some people have been thinking about doing, um, putting oyster beds out there, but again, they do better on the bay side than the ocean side. Um, but the interesting thing is, if you go look at Blakeman's at low tide, you can see several hundred feet of peat, where you can see that it used to be salt marsh, um, you know, not even, you know, 150 years ago, but you could see giant chunks of it. So you can see that the beach is moving. Um, but I haven't heard of artificial reefs. I mean, I'm a big marine fan, so I think that'd be a great idea. <laughs> Very good. Um couple more and they're coming in as we as we uh, continue here. Uh, well, first of all, a lot of kudos, wonderful presentation. Thank you. It's been very interesting. You're doing such great work. Uh, are you considering planting other sand salt tolerant species, um, beach pea, uh, sweet or, or like beach goldenrod? Um, yeah. That's a really good question. Um, 
If you look at um, Plum Hills right now, that's the area that was pretty overwashed and devastated. There's a lot of different plants there. So what we did is we took a plant inventory. So you look at the whole area and say, okay, 40% was bare. And then of that 60% remaining, how many different species um, were there and then what their abundance was. One of my colleagues, Bradford Bauer did that work. And though we probably won't plant those items there because they're not gonna get a chance to grow. And there's even cedar trees that are there as well. We took that full inventory. So Bradford's work isn't gonna be in vain because we're asking for permission to plant those in other locations. Um, and introducing new species um, is usually a little more difficult, um, but the key is doing the inventory of everything that we have there. So we definitely would like some sweet pea there um, and goldenrod as long as we can make sure that um, um, it stays where we want. I, I don't think goldenrod is really invasive, if you will, um, but can, can grow a little bit more. So we want to be very selective um, and know what we're planting before we plant it. Right now, I hate to say this, but um, we have a little bit of a concern with vegetative die-off um, and if aphids are the cause or not. So we're really keeping an eye on some of our patches to see if it was just because um, it was too much rain, if you will, last summer. So once we get a handle on what's happened in those areas, we're going to be looking at that inventory to see what we can add and where. Great. And I would think that like uh, beach pea and, and uh, goldenrod would would uh, uh, naturally uh, pioneer into those areas because it's so present elsewhere on the beach. Exactly. I think Russ might need to contact me and, and help us with our vegetative issues. Uh, so. <laughs> Not issues, but expand what we have. We're always looking, uh, always looking for some good plant people, if you will, um, mm -hmm. especially folks that understand that spacing is important. Um, mm -hmm. So we follow the regs with plant diversity. And then Martha asked probably a question that uh, a lot of people uh, ask is where, what and where are the access uh, ways to Duxbury Beach? So from um, a car driving, there's two different access points. One is from the town of Duxbury over the Powder Point Bridge. I'll give a plug for the town there. It was one of the longest wooden uh, plank bridges in the country. I think someone beat them a couple of years ago, but we don't like to talk about that. Um, so you can come um, over the wooden um, plank bridge on Powder Point Road. It's a, it's a beautiful drive um, at low tide. It never ceases to amaze me how mud flats can be there. And then the high tide comes and, and cuts into the shoreline. The other way is through um, Marshfield. Um, there's access point right off um, now, I just wanted to say 30, 39. How bad am I? I always come through the bridge because that's where my, that's well, where no, my so yeah. So it's uh, so it's Canal Street off of 139. Thank you. Yeah, Canal Street off 139. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a great, great view as well. A totally different view, but you get to see all of the marsh, the, the salt marsh when I was talking about the 900 and 17 acres of salt marsh. You can see a really beautiful salt marsh on the way in from the Marshfield end. And, and Martha, just to be clear, there, there's a, a there's a, a part, there's a public parking area for the town of Duxbury and for those that have permits, but then there's another one near Blakeman's that's open to the public. You pay, uh, but it's, it's in my mind, uh, a pretty fair price for a day at the beach. Uh, and and that it's a pretty big parking lot, and they have overflow, so good chances uh, that you won't get turned away. Right, and the parking goes into effect um, a little before Memorial Day, mm -hmm. so before that, um, the parking lots are are pretty open. We keep some of the bigger ones, you know, the the it holds over twelve hundred cars. We keep some of those closed in the winter just to kind of manage. But folks can go there and and park. Um, over the Powder Point Bridge and kind of that large lot right there. And then there's um, access to people to drive down the road if they have an oversand vehicle permit. Um, but there's there's lots of access on Bayside as well as Oceanside. You get to see all those different ecosystems just within a 20 minute walk. 
Great, and I think that does it for now. And boy, the timing is just right. It looks like we are just hitting eight o'clock. So, uh, Brian, why don't I hand it back to you to wrap us up? Um, but that, thank you again, Chris. That was wonderful. Great. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody, for your great questions. Thanks so much, Chris. This is a fantastic presentation. And uh, there's a lot of information here that's comparable to places that we do programs at the North and South Rivers Watershed, um, a little bit further to the north. It's a lot of these same um, topics and concerns uh, can be seen elsewhere. So, it's, so you guys are doing a fantastic work. And I really look forward to um, uh, partnering and collaborating with you guys in the future. I think there's a lot of great uh, uh, connections that we can make between our two um, organizations. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. We will have a guided event uh, Saturday morning at Dexter Beach. Everyone who has registered for this program will be sent a link to register. It'll be kept to a small group, uh, first come first serve. So everyone will get equal chance to sign up. Um, and, um, uh, and so uh, thank you for those of you who would be interested in that. It will be free, and, uh, but registration will be required. And, um, and so uh, once again, a, a special thanks to um, all of our sponsors, um, Clean Harbors, Lynch Marini, and the Mass Cultural Council of Norwell, Duxbury, um, Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, and Situate. Uh, thanks uh, again to, to all of our sponsors for continuing to support educational programs just like this. And um, uh, so this is episode seven. We will have our last episode uh, eight, which will be next week, same time, same day, uh, which will be um, Hiking 101, Hiking the South Shore. And that will be brought to you by uh, Doug Lowry, Mass Audubon, uh, North South Rivers Watershed, myself, as well as one of our uh, correspondents and former um, director, assistant director, Akiza Bacon. So um, if you're interested in getting out while the weather starts to get a little bit warmer, we're around in the corner towards spring, um, and you're interested in learning some cool and hidden gems in and around the South Shore, tune in next week. With that, thank you so much, Doug, once again. Thank you very much, Kristen, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we will see you next week. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.